Welcome to the Artfully Learning audio series. I'm your host, Adam Zucker. My guest today is Liz Brady, who is an artist, curator, and mental health advocate. She's based in the UK. Liz founded an art collective called Broken Gray Wires, where she curates exhibitions that deal with themes related to mental health and identity. Liz's work is focused on changing the narrative around mental health, both in terms of destigmatizing mental health, as well as creating spaces for people to look at art, talk about art, and experience artistic moments in ways that help them de-stress, handle trauma, and maybe cope with other experiences that they're having. One of the things that Liz is addressing is making arts and cultural spaces more comfortable and accessible to neurodivergent audiences. Her recently developed MAD Manual is a toolkit that provides resources and inspiring thoughts that help gallery goers feel welcome and engaged with both the artwork and the overall gallery environment. So welcome, Liz. The first question I'd like to ask you is, how and why did the idea to create a mental health toolkit for arts and cultural spaces come about? Well, the initial idea came about in about 2017, and I was curating a show in London, and that was the first ever proper like Broken Grey Wires exhibition. I'd had a few ideas about sort of helping or trying to encourage people to engage more with the work. It all sort of stemmed from my own personal experiences of being in art spaces and not feeling comfortable, having a lot of anxiety. And even though I am an artist, still not feeling like I belonged in those spaces. So I wanted to create something to help people that were experiencing similar things to me. And it sort of got put on the back burner a little bit. Um, just sort of general admin work, things like fun- having to apply for funding constantly, um, millions of emails every day. And it was only really the last year that I applied specifically for like a research grant to develop the toolkit and started to work on it further. Yeah. So, I mean, it looks great. I've seen the uh, the basic the prototype, I would say, but it's, yeah. it's getting near completion because you're going to be debuting it up uh, in uh, February at, um, what is it, at Middlesbrough? I wanted, Middlesbrough, yeah. <laughs> uh, I said it correctly, yes. Yeah, the North UK East. geography. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you're going to be debuting it at, at, a, at a Broken Grey Wires exhibition in, in Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough. Middlesbrough, yeah. <laughs> Middlesbrough, okay, there we go. Um, and uh, and yeah, so it's so it's basically ready. Uh, it's exciting. It looks, yeah. it's designed beautifully. I'm excited about this toolkit, especially for the reasons you mentioned, because myself included, and I'm sure a majority of the people listening or a good amount of the people listening to this have felt the same way, whether they're just anxious about going into a gallery because they're afraid they won't understand it or they'll feel out of place or they get anxious in crowds. All of those reasons are addressed within the activities and guidance in the yeah. manual toolkit. So I guess we've, we spoke about who your intended audience is mm-hmm. and who you envision getting the most benefit from this resource. I think you would probably say that it's anyone going into a gallery space. Is that Correct. Yeah, I think I think anyone going into a gallery space, and that's probably because I believe that everyone has had or will go through have experience of mental health issues and mental health needs. I think that I am probably aiming it more towards people that identify as having mental health needs. So the so it's called the Mad Manual Toolkit. And that sort of come from me doing a master's in mad studies, which is a is sort of a radical voice exploring madness and disability. So it's like listening to people that identify as mad and then learning about like historical and contemporary madness and creating safe spaces and better support networks for communities. So I've I've not been on the course that long, but from what I've learned so far, it's it's become apparent that it's important to me to sort of use the word mad 
and not be apologetic about having things focused for people who identify as mad as well. It's like it is for everyone, but it is specifically for those who identify as having a mental health disability. Sure. I think that's very important to make that distinction. And neurodivergency is a very broad spectrum too. So exactly, yeah, I mean, definitely. You know, people who might not identify with it specifically have experienced it. And I would say more often than not would identify with it if they had the vocabulary behind it, which is something that the arts, especially Broken Grey Wires, is doing, is giving people that vocabulary. Definitely. I mean, it's also like with Broken Grey Wires, you know, the work that I do, I I do try to create like alternative ways to support audiences and also educating communities to care for themselves and each other. I don't know what it's like in America as much, but in the UK, like the, the mental health system is just on its knees. It's becoming apparent that it's up to us really to support each other as well as protesting for a better system uh, with the NHS and how the NHS can can support people going through crisis. There needs to be more funding, obviously, from the government. But I do think like when I was researching for one of my essays, on the Mad Studies course and sort of finding and discovering certain groups that were offering free tools, I guess toolkits, sort of pamphlets and self-help, sort of how to reduce harm guides and things. So that was quite interesting. And it's definitely sort of made me want to pursue that a little bit as well. So the toolkit will be free in this gallery space um, and people can you go and use it in any sort of art spaces moving forward after the exhibition that they visit with me. The prompts that you created are open-ended. There's several categories that you've organized the manual into, which gives gallery goers a lot of options and they can choose whatever prompts they relate to most. But can you give an example or two of some of these prompts and maybe the ways yeah. it could be used when someone's in the space? Yeah, so there will be like a, a sort of board where on like pegs there will be the activity cards and you will come in and you will just pick a, a like a folder that we've got and then you can sort of browse through the activities so there's mindfulness uh writing drawing and movement they're the four categories and then there'll be there'll be five or six different activities sort of per theme so for example in the movement one there is a taking up space. So to feel connected to your surroundings uh, when looking at the art, if it is safe to do so and without touching anything, try to expand your body to take up more space than it would be by just being still. In the mindfulness one, we've got focusing on your senses. So visualize yourself being in one of the artworks and ask, what can you hear, smell? see taste or touch and write down as many as you can so within the activity card that you pick up there will be space for you to sort of write any findings any ideas thoughts doodles whatever you can use that obviously how you want to do and you'll also get a broken grow wise pen in your toolkit pack so yeah there are a couple of um, activities that that will be available for people it's a tenet of art education these things that you're mentioning you know responding to these creative prompts of course is what we do in education we we give students or whomever we're working with the option that should be open-ended because everyone engages with art differently exactly yeah and i think it's important too we're talking about neurodivergent populations where there's a lot of both stigma around neurodivergency in the arts as well as neurodivergent people having different experiences in gallery spaces, right? But I, you're giving people the option to interpret things in their own way and time. So I think yeah. one of the things too that you've done in in spaces and you are continuing to do is give people uh, room to take a breather from the actual artwork itself, which can be sort of upbeat work, but it's still a very serious themes. Can you talk about your curatorial vision of how you really incorporate so many different interdisciplinary works that talk about identity and mental health? And also then we talk about the ways you break up the space nicely and have these relaxation 
zones and places for people to maybe fill out these toolkits in a place where they can be you know, at peace and calm? Yeah, well, the the sort of the chill out area in this upcoming exhibition uh, is going to be called the comfort zone. So it's going to be a space for audiences to sort of relax and reflect on the artwork and the exhibition topics. Because obviously, like you say, like the work is about mental health and can be can be triggering for some people. So I think it's really important to sort of have that area that people can just be present in. So the comfort zone, people will be invited to to come into there and there'll be a zine library as well. Uh, so the zines will be exploring the topics of mental health, queerness, identity, and the actual exhibition has got artists such as Bill Viola, uh, Gillian Waring, Pipilotti Wrist, Martin Creed, and Daniel Johnston. So I guess the work is rooted in lived experience of mental illness. Um, it's got different sort of, it's got neons, photography, uh, interactive installations and video. And it will be, just give me a minute, Adam, because bronze is like chew my arm off. Bronze! Sorry, I know that's really no, annoying. because No really worries. Bad. Ow, get off. Stop it. Oh, wow. can't. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, we're not That's going to be annoying to edit out. Bronze, or you could keep it. Bronze is Liz's dog for anyone who does. <laughs> yeah, stuff it. <laughs> who couldn't infer from the... Uh, no, we'll, yeah, we can... <laughs> I get a lot of things with dogs barking, actually. Really? So many people have... have a, a barking dog. I mean, I can't believe she's not barking, but... Yeah, that, like, well, that's... I guess that's the silver lining, right? The barking would be more. I'm trying to get her to chew a stick because she's getting a bit aggy, but she's just, she had my arm. Ah. She thought it was part of the stick. <laughs> she wouldn't let go, right? She's let go now. Okay. She right, you're going to just get the stick. Okay, I've lost my train of thought now as well. Oh, yeah, I think, well, we were talking about, you know, just the, the, the different uh, materials and, Oh, yeah, themes yeah. and artworks that are displayed in Broken Grey Wires exhibitions. And okay. that reflects also the different experiences that people have with mental illness too. So it's a well-rounded presentation of ideas, identities, feelings, emotions, uh, and socialization that is all involved with our psyche and our mental health yeah. and how we deal with it. You know, and I think it does help, you know, as an educator, I see it with students who have both social and emotional needs that are hard to address in the school, traditional school environment. Mm. I've, I've found that, you know, when they get into the art room, generally they are fulfilled somehow just by yeah. being in that space. And because it's so open ended and, you know, it's not dogmatic, the curriculum is not like other curricula where you have to, you know, teach to, some sort of standardization or tests. I mean, we have general benchmarks in art education that we try to uh, express and uh, teach the students, you know, to, to develop. But yeah. we, we, I think through art, we realize best of all the subjects that development is not like a linear thing. Like, you know, yeah. it shouldn't be forced upon us like as A, B, C, D, mm. you know, we, we all develop differently and we have mental health related issues that can impact yeah definitely you. I think there definitely needs to be more support for example in universities here when I was doing my degree you know so many people so many pe of the students had mental health needs and there just wasn't really the support and I, that, I mean that was 10 years ago maybe it's changed now but like I feel like seeing sort of my cousins who were younger than me and my partner's like younger sisters like there seems to be so much more sort of discussion around mental health needs and like that that, that it is getting better and people are more open-minded about the fact that sometimes people have mental health issues and like they shouldn't like because there is obviously still a lot of stigma around but I do think and hope that sort of the younger generations coming through are more more open-minded about it and more willing to to talk about it and I guess like through the toolkit um, and the work that I do with Broken Bay Wire is like just sort of normalizing the fact that people go through mental health problems in their life. And like, I think trying to portray that art 
and the experience of arts can be a facilitator for recovery. And however that recovery manifests for the individual is really important. You know, from looking at this toolkit, I think that's what's going to be the conclusion. It's an ongoing process. And the beauty of it is that it is organic and you've, you're mm. working with several different artists and educators who are contributing to both the activities and the prompts and the overall structure and implementation of this toolkit. And so I see it as something that's going to be in a lot of different museums and galleries and, and really help people out. One thing too, you mentioned support that is either not there or is still in its infancy around supporting students and professionals who are suffering or finding themselves stifled both professionally, you know, in their jobs or creatively because of mental health related issues. I think doctors are getting really stressed because they're dealing with people who are experiencing a lot of trauma. Exactly. There have been traumatic times for all of us, especially, especially the last... yeah, COVID. Like you see the the nurses and people that have had to just work through it and going into hospitals where there's not enough safety equipment for them. And they I mean, in I don't know what it was like in America, but I know over here they were wearing bin bags because there wasn't enough you know, like aprons and stuff. And then having to be away from their families while they were working and there's been no mental health support for those for those people. They're meant to just, oh, it's gone now. Get o- sort of get over it, kind of thing, and carry on working like nothing happened. And yeah, yeah, I think that that trauma. I mean, it's definitely the same here. If if not, yeah. probably this on the same scale. I mean, we both had terrible leadership through it all. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. where you know, again, it's one thing. It's not listening to the actual people who are exactly, yeah. the disabled community has been ringing these alarms for years, sounding yeah. alarm for years that you know things are not right. The infrastructure is not in place. There's people that are going to suffer if a cataclysmic event happens that yeah. we're not ready for on a wide scale societal level and that's what's you know apparent but the silver lining and the good news if if anything you know is what we're talking about here now is that the arts have really studies have shown have have helped medical programs are making it requirements now for medical students to learn about the arts you know yeah, yeah. analyzing the painting it helps you become a better observer you're more in tune and some of the exercises in the toolkit do that as well, getting in the mindfulness exercises where you're actually just spending time looking at a work. Yeah. Really just getting in tune with how that work makes you feel and not even responding to it right away. You're just giving people the time to just sit there. And I think that's something that carries over into general society and how we operate. Just having that moment to relax and to look at an artwork it helps you escape from some of the burdensome realities that you may be facing and then using that relaxation and that inspiration to help better the the situation you're in so you're creating this better reality through looking at works of art and letting yourself become inspired or just respond to it freely without any judgment really that's key of what art can do and that's you know that's the uh benefit that i see from the mad manual among you know obviously it's going to be yeah. very personal for many different people yeah i agree i think that it's you know we was, we sort of touched a bit on it earlier where it's giving audiences the the tools to to use these activities in other spaces as well so it's sort of giving them the autonomy to choose the activities firstly you know they and then supporting them to make their own decisions regarding their health and I think that's what is so important like at the moment where I I feel like the government are not doing that for us and I think it's like creating those kind of spaces where people can come together and meet like-minded people and look at art and like you've got the comfort zone where they can go and chill out and read zines if they want or just bring a cup of tea in and just chill out in that space you know there's no requirement there's no necessity for them to do like there's just nothing they can just come in and relax especially because it's going to be cold we're going to have heaters in there as well yeah that's necessary as we're heading into this long dark winter ahead of us yeah (laughs) mental health is going to be a on the precipice of that yeah well i mean because you've obviously got like seasonal affective depression as well like this is it seasonal affective disorder 
uh, sad. So, you know, it's even more the fact that the exhibition's in February when it's dark and cold and wet and windy is, you know, kind of another reason why it needs to be sort of there because people are do s- struggle more in the winter, don't they? They do, yeah. I mean, and right, and it gives them something to do, as you said, yeah. space to to go to, uh, sort of a, you know, a tranquil way of getting out of out of the house, yeah. getting yeah. getting out of their framework of their yeah. frame of mind too that can be uh, in some ways stifling and entering this welcoming environment you know and and sometimes yeah. that one little experience in the day is just what someone needs exactly. to get out of something that could have been lasting for months you know and and hopefully it sparks continued interest and becomes sort of like a, like a cognitive behavioral response to uh, future mental health crises that people will be experiencing. They can use the examples in the toolkit and really yeah, harness definitely. their inner artistic mindset to feel at ease, feel calm, and channel that stress and anxiety into the act of creating and responding and or just looking and interpreting yeah. and turning artful experiences into relaxing ones and enjoy. Exactly, yeah, definitely. There's so, also yeah. going to be a number of um there's going to be a number of workshops happening over the the five weeks as well so there's sort of plenty of ways that people can get involved and meet others and it's the, all the workshops will be sort of exploring the artwork in in the project and looking at our own mental health and how we can use art to help with our recovery and again no sort of there's no pressure on that for people to have like an epiphany or anything it's it's literally just get involved and create something new Excellent. Yeah. And on that note, why don't we end the conversation with you giving us a little bit of a uh, information about, you know, what the exhibition's called and where can it be seen and how it can be seen. Yeah, so for those of us who are not in the UK. Can yeah, in the UK. That, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, two, it's called Two Plus Two Makes Four. It's at the Auxiliary Project Space in Middlesbrough, which is in the northeast in the UK. Uh, from the 16th of February to the 24th of March. And I will also be um, creating a website. So there'll be an online space and there will be, the toolkit will be available to download from there for free in certain iterations of that. So it's not going to be exactly like it will be physically, but there will be like an online version of that. So people can get involved that way. There'll also be online zine libraries and signposting for mental health support. And some other things that will be developed sort of over the next couple of months leading up to the show. I'm looking forward to it. And of course, we'll be promoting it, you know, on Artfully Learning. And, and so thank you. Yeah. Access those links and hopefully getting it to the States as well. Really we yeah. getting it to the States. So if any museums are interested in this idea, you know, reach out, reach out to Liz. Definitely. Open yeah. Gray Wires. And we're so excited. Thank you for taking the time to talk about the Mad Manual Toolkit with us in mental health and educating us you know, on how we can utilize art in more mindful ways and to help neurodivergence people have gallery experiences that are comforting on their own terms. So thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me on, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Artfully Learning audio series. Thanks again to my guest today, Liz Brady. If you've enjoyed listening to this episode, please check out the prior episodes on this YouTube channel and also click the like and subscribe buttons.